morning, everybody. Something very, very, very important that I need to announce to you. This Wednesday, March 1st, Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 1. So I think we should cancel class and just watch that. We won't do that, but yes, I'm excited. Um, let's see. You should have gotten, I'm hoping you got an announcement from me. Should have gotten an announcement from me. I'm also hoping you got an email about evaluating me. Did you guys get an email from like the system or something like that? Okay. So uh, I am being evaluated this semester. This is something that happens once every three years. It's been once every six for me because the last time I got evaluated, we had a pandemic. <laughs> so um, I feel like it's been six years. So click the link in that email. Go do that survey. If I could, I would give you extra credit for just doing it, but they won't give me a list of who's done it and who hasn't again to protect you so um, but please 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 uh, fill out that survey be honest uh, put whatever you feel like in there if you want to take me to task for Newton's second law and blame me for all of those problems that Newton put on you that is fine but seriously um, of all the parts of the evaluation okay um, it, your comments your feedback that's to me the best part it's the most valuable part to me I get, a, I get evaluated by my boss, I get evaluated by another teacher, those are great, but the, the, the stuff that my students say um, is always the best stuff, good and bad. So please, please, um, just pour your heart out onto that page. Um, try not to leave any self-identifying information. <laughs> I had students just drop stuff in there that they're like, hey, hey it's me, Mr. Right? It's just fine. I don't see any of this stuff until after the semester is all over, so it won't be affecting your grades. Um, my boss and the peer evaluator do get to see it before the end of the semester. But uh, I just encourage you, please, um, to fill that out. Take, take the 10 minutes it takes to do that, and I will, I will be very grateful to you um, for doing that. Uh, let's see. Uh, evaluations, uh, check those announcements out. This Thursday's lab is lab number seven. Uh, we'll be doing the centripetal motion. I know I said that we were going to take a field trip today. That field trip has been postponed, okay, uh, just because of the weather. It's too wet outside. It leaves it unsafe for what we need to do, which I will still leave you hanging as to what the field trip actually is until then. Uh, but hopefully Wednesday. And then if Wednesday doesn't work out, Thursday is supposed to be sunny, so maybe during Lent um, we'll take a little uh, excursion to do something. But you'll, you'll, you'll see what that is. Um, what's happening a week from this Thursday? <laughs> Exam on Newton's Laws and on Energy, right? Chapter 5, 6, and then chapter 7 and 8. Um, four chapters on the exam, but really it's just it's two topics, isn't it? All right, and as promised, uh, we've got a quiz. I, I delayed this one from last time, so let's go ahead and dust off the weekend's cobwebs by doing a quiz. We did have one more topic to cover in chapter seven before we can get to chapter eight. This is a, this is a slight tangent, it, it applies um, but it's, it's slightly bit of a different animal, and it's something that is going to keep coming up here and there um, as we go through. So this is this is probably as good a time as any to talk about it. So when you hear the word power, what do you what do you, what come what jumps to mind? Superman. Electricity. Electricity. I'm in a room full of geeks. Nobody said money. Right. Because everybody knows that money is power, right? Okay. Well, we're, of course, going to do the scientific definition. But I am, the school begs me to do stuff like this. So I'm going to appease the powers that be. They're probably listening. I can call back I think there's video cameras and all the eyes of the beast on the wall. Um, so they beg me to do stuff like teaching across the curriculum. I don't know if you guys know what that means, but it's like, I'm supposed to incorporate things like history and English and philosophy and physical education and all these other, for, for, for a well-rounded general education. <laughs> Social media destroyed all of that. Um, 
So I've got some quotes here about power that I'd like to share with you. Um, anybody know who Thomas Jefferson was? Yeah? Okay. I hope our wisdom will grow with our power and teach us that the less we use our power, the greater it will be. Kind of deep, right? Kind of? Manifest destiny of America and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Abraham Lincoln? Kind of, kind of tall guy in the Civil War. Wasn't his fault. And of course, we should update the language here. He refers to men, but we should include everybody in this statement. I'll, I'll read it as originally written. Nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Oh, that's deep, isn't it? It's like pushing the boundaries of morality and all that kind of stuff here. And then, and then for this last quote, I, I don't even need to read, read the paper. This one, this one seared, seared into my mind. And I wish I could do this one justice. I can't because I can't do the voice. So you'll just have to imagine the correct voice, OK? When I, when I give you the quote. And the quote is this. The power to destroy a planet is insignificant when compared with the power of the force. Who said that? Darth Vader, right? Episode four, New Hope, the first movie. <laughs> not, not, they did not, the prequel. That, that didn't happen, okay? The original. He was talking to Grand Moff Tarkin and the Death Star, Princess Leia. Anyway, um, power. Power when it comes to physics, or at least mechanics, right, and engineering and all that kind of stuff. We define it. We're supposed to use this triple equal sign to say that we're just saying that this is what it is. We're going to define this. I don't like the term. It makes me confused. It's the amount of work that's done in a certain amount of time. So with power, we start introducing this temporal equivalent, and so it's a little bit more dynamic than, say, the work might be. Uh, what are the units here? What are the units of work? Joules. Joules. What are the units of time? Second. So a joule per second is going to be something that you, I know you recognize. We call this a watt. And where have you heard of watts before? Electricity. Okay. So electrical power, a 100 watt light bulb. How many joules of energy or work is consumed by that light bulb every second if it's 100 watts? 100 joules. Okay. So this is why LED light bulbs are more efficient than, say, incandescent light bulbs. So a, a, a light bulb that gives an equivalent light output, okay, but only runs on 10 watts right, is 90% more efficient, right? It, it's 10 joules per second instead of 100 joules per second of electrical energy usage. So whereas watts, almost always we hear that in terms of electrical power, it is a unit that is used in mechanical power as well. And since work, right, is a force times a distance, we can always calculate right, how much work is done. And if we know how much time it took for that work to take place, we'd have, a, we'd have a power output in watts. There's something interesting going on here, because what's a distance divided by a time? Think like chapter 2, kinematic. That's a velocity, isn't it? And so another way to get to power is to take a force and dot product it into how fast it's going. So we can figure out the power that is required to maintain a certain speed. If we know the force, say, of propulsion of a rocket, or an airplane propeller, or a car's motor, and we know how fast it's going, then we can tell you what power output is required. Now, generally, if we're talking about vehicles, especially in the United States, we don't use watts to measure the power of an engine. What do we use instead? Horsepower. Okay. First question. What kind of horse? 
I've worked with horses a lot in the past life. And you've got your you got your quarter horses and all that, right? Sort of sort of standard Mustang, that sort of stuff, right? Which are what everybody sort of considers they think of a horse and a cowboy riding the horse as a standard. But, but then you've got like at Icelandic ponies, okay? Some of which are smaller than like Great Dane dogs. Like they're they're just small horses, right? Or the Great Dane is just a big Right, okay? But they're really tiny. I, I actually got to ride on the Icelandic pony once and my feet touched the ground while I was sitting on its back. Right? Okay, so this isn't the big. And then you've got like Belgians or uh, people are more familiar with the Clydesdales of the Budweiser commercial. Okay? Those are, those are elephants that look like horses. Like, like I had to work around Belgians for several years, dra they're draft horses. You don't ride these horses. They pull stuff, right? Plows, stagecoaches, wagons, whatever, right? And one day, I got it into my mind that I was going to ride one, right? So I sat on its back. My legs would not go around it. 2,400 pounds of animal, right? This is a big animal, right? Okay. And so I got on its back and I had to sit like cross-legged. I felt like I was riding an elephant, right? Like I needed a basket to sit in or something because, and the horse just kind of looked at me like, what the heck is going on? And then just wandered around the paddock. Anyway, what kind of horse? And what exactly is a horse power? This, this is a weird unit. Well, it turns out it actually has a definition, okay? <laughs> a horsepower is exactly 746 watts. <laughs> it's, it's not my fault. And that is equivalent to its original definition. The horsepower's original definition was 550 feet pounds per second. So what's going on there? What's a foot pound per second? What's a foot pound? Feet is a unit of distance. Pounds is a unit of force or weight, right? So we've got a force times a distance. What's a foot pound? It's work, right? Then we divide by time to get our power. So in the imperial system of units, the horsepower, right? Anything that could move 550 pounds, through a distance of one foot in one second was defined as a horsepower. And the reason that they were using this metric is because they wanted to compare steam engines to horses, right? And so it just kind of got adopted. Uh, if you go to Europe actually, and you start looking or you do like any kind of racing, F1 racing or motor vehicle racing, quite often the vehicle's power is given to you in kilowatts, not horsepower. Right? So they'll say that the, the engine in this racing vehicle has a power output of 2.1 kilowatts. Well, that's 2,100 watts, right? You can make the conversion into horsepower if you want to. So uh, horsepower and watts, especially in motor vehicles, are almost interchangeable nowadays. They're both very common units. Here in the United States, a little bit less so. But um, horsepower is that is an imperial unit that seems to be sticking around for a lot of historical reasons. Anyway, calculating power is pretty straightforward. Once you know force times distance and you know the time, you can do it. You can go forwards and backwards in this. Um, and uh, we will wait till Wednesday or Thursday before I do some examples of calculating this. You should be able to do your homework. It's, it's pretty straightforward, all the equations you need are on that screen. Let's instead move forward. To chapter 8. So I really want to start doing a whole bunch of examples. And before I can get there, I've got one more thing to clear up, okay? And that is gravitational potential energy. So, so far, I talked to you about work. I taught you about kinetic energy, energy of motion, 
And now we need to talk about potential energy, the energy that's stored. And in this case, uh, we did a little bit of the storage already. We talked about the work done by a spring, 1 half kx squared. Well, surprise, surprise, that's its potential energy. In the case of gravity, the energy is stored in the gravitational field. Right? There's this pattern of forces that exists all around the planet. And if I just hold the ball here, is the Earth pulling on it? Yes. In other words, does it have weight? Yes, right? Okay. So the Earth is pulling on it, but I'm providing enough force to cancel out the pull, right? I have to remove the force in order for gravity to win and accelerate the object. So. The Earth is pulling on it here. If I let go of it, what kind of energy is it going to gain? Kinetic. It's going to start moving, right? And that energy had to come from somewhere. So it came from the potential energy that's stored because of where the ball is in the Earth's gravitational field. So we need to talk about the work that gravity does. Okay, we know the force, right? Um, oh, and, and by the way, when it comes to gravity, what direction is the force? Down. Down. And what direction is it moving? Its displacement? Also down, right? Okay, so can we agree that the force and the direction are in the same direction so I don't have to keep writing cosine of zero degrees here? Just going to do force times it. So what's the force? Yeah, it's mg, right? We know the mass of the ball. We know which planet we're on. We know that's the weight, right? It's the force that gravity acts on it. And then um, what can we write down for the distance that it falls? Ooh, we used delta y back in chapter 2, didn't we? In 4, we could use that. But this is physics. Of course, you've got to make it more complicated. So <laughs> we're going to use h. <laughs> I think your book uses delta y, but a lot of places just use h as the, the height that the ball drops through. But that height is really a delta y. Okay? So, so you can use mg delta y if you want, whatever. Right? Physicists, I think, like to use mgh simply because it's one less thing to write. We don't have to write delta and then y. Some, like, some books just use mgy. Right? So anyway. In order to know this height, what else do I have to know? Like if I'm saying that this ball is sitting one meter above the ground, what's implied in that statement? That the ground is zero, that the ground is zero right? Okay. Because if zero were at the ceiling, I'd have to say that the position of the ball was minus three meters. Why minus three? Zero's up there, and this usually is the negative direction, isn't it? So, gravitational potential energy, the value of gravitational potential energy, depends on where we pick zero. Now, that's a superpower. Because that means if we're allowed to pick zero wherever we want, we can pick it in some pretty clever places or some pretty nasty places when it comes to the mathematics. So with that superpower comes kind of a weakness, right? There's a kryptonite in there if we're going to use more Superman analogies, right? Because if we're not careful about where we pick zero, things can go wrong. But on the flip side, it actually doesn't matter where you pick zero as long as you're careful about what you do. Let me see if I can't help you understand what's going on here. Let's say I pick zero to be the floor. It, the ground level is a very typical place to pick zero. There's nothing wrong with it. It's often a, a place that I pick zero as well. So let's just say that we, we say that ground level is zero. And we hold a ball above the ground, OK? Um, and uh, let's just say that and I'm just trying to make the numbers easy here, right? But let's say I hold it far enough above the ground that it has 10 joules of gravitational potential. All right. If I want to calculate, okay, the change in potential energy, 
The delta always means what? Final minus initial, right? The final amount, okay. So if I drop that ball, it starts with 10 joules of energy, and then what's the potential energy when it gets to the ground, which is the zero point? Zero, right? So the work here, this, this potential energy, the thing I forgot to tell you, this is the amount of work. The potential energy is just mg times the position, right? And so if we say that the ground is zero, we put in the position of zero, then it has zero energy over there, right? So it starts with 10. It ends up with zero joules. And so my change in potential energy for this one, let me write the, oh, let me write this over here. Change in potential energy for this case is final, zero, minus the initial positive 10, right? And I get negative 10 joules. So let's do another case. We're going to do exactly the same thing, but this time we are going to set the zero point to be where the ball is, right? So this is, this is our zero joule point. If we go through exactly the same distance, then what would the energy be at the floor? Negative 10, because it's below our zero point, right? And now if I do my change in potential energy, what's the final energy value? Negative 10. And what did I start with? zero and what answer do i get i get exactly the same thing so what's the take home here the value of potential energy like what the potential energy is at any point in space does depend on where you pick zero and it can change but the one thing that never changes is the difference the change in potential energy doesn't care where zero is. So what we want to do is we want to pick easy places to calculate these things, right? We want to pick our zeros smartly. I is an English major, right? In order to simplify the calculations that we have to do and, and kind of avoid some of the mental gymnastics and all of that overhead that our brains have to deal with so that we can get to where we want to be. So let me show you how to safely navigate, right, any situation where we're going to be using conservation of energy to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to show you the problem solving process. I've showed you this twice already. So here it is in its third form. And then we're going to just start doing examples. And we're going to do examples that we know. I was going to say no and love, but this is physics, right? So free fall, um, armadillos sliding down hills, okay? Like some of these tried and true examples that we've had throughout the class, we're going to do, but we're going to do them with the lens or through the point of view of conservation of energy. So here is the sort of problem solving process. And again, I stick to this four step process. It's sort of the details of how we visualize and how we strategize change, but you can always come back to this core concept of you want to make sure you do the due diligence of imagining what's going on in the problem first. In the case of Newton's second law, I was always drawing a free body diagram. Here, free body diagrams are still helpful. You'll see why as we go through examples. So don't just ditch the free body diagram and run screaming around going, oh, I'm free, I'm free. You're not, okay? But they don't need to be nearly as involved as they were before. For our strategy, okay, unlike the first unit where we had several things in our toolbox and we sort of had to plan out what tools we were going to use, conservation of energy has one tool, okay? It's that statement right there that I began with back in Chapter 7. Sort of the overall, this is where we're going. We're going to apply, we're going to use what we know about work and the kinds of energies that we know about to see if we can't pull off some amazing analysis in the problem. Of course, the do it step is always what? What are you doing in the do it step? Math, right? That's where you're actually executing on all the algebra you have to do. And then there will be some checks. All right. 
So let's. Oops. Start doing some examples. Okay, we're all going to do free fall, and um, let's do let's just do the the case right. <clears throat> Excuse me, where I drop a ball, okay, um, through a through a distance. Okay, so I'm going to take an object. I'm going to have it sitting a certain height above the ground, and I'm going to let go and I'm going to drop it. And and for old times' sake. How would we do this if we were using, say, chapter two kinematics, vertical kinematic? You don't want to remember? No, oh, no, 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 not that one. Sometimes, oh, come on, iPad. Sometimes the iPad has a mind of its own. I'm going to go there. Okay, can I do this now? There we go. So if we were doing this with kinematics, right, we would make our list. Uh, final, initial, acceleration, time, delta y. Uh, we don't know how fast it's going straight again. We're dropping it so we know it starts at zero meters per second. What's the acceleration of something in free fall? Oh, we had to have that sign on there. Okay. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to be in the air, but we do know kind of the height that it falls through, right? But if I say that it falls through, I don't know, 10 meters, what did I have to remember to be really careful about with this 10 meters? The sign. the sign. Where does the ball end up if we're dropping it? Lower, right, than where it started. So we had to, and that minus sign did trip you up, didn't it? Homework, exams, that, those sort of places, right? We had to be really careful. And so given all of that, which of the tools from the toolbox would you pick in order to find the... Um, I don't know, speed that this thing is going when it strikes the ground. Do you remember at all what any of the tools were? Ooh, the third equation? What's, what was so nice about that third equation? Didn't have time in it, didn't it? Okay. And so since the initial speed was zero, I just take the square root and I have two times a times my delta y, and if I was careful with my signs, I wouldn't get any imaginary numbers. So just, just, a, just a refresher, right, on all the things that we had to think about and do when we did it that way. Okay, so let's do this now using conservation of energy. So in the conservation of energy problem solving process, the first thing you want to do in your visualization is uh, draw a picture. Like, here's the ball. And then it goes down and it hits the ground, okay? We're after how fast is it going when it strikes the ground. You want to identify two points, always. You're gonna always do this because conservation of energy requires it. You need a spot where the thing starts doing something and the spot where you wanna analyze something. We usually call this the initial and final. Since we're being asked, how fast is the ball going right before it strikes the ground, I'm going to put my final point to be right at the point where it strikes the ground. It, the final point is usually the point at which you want to know something. If I wanted to know how fast it was going halfway down its path, I would put the final point halfway down, right? So put the final point where you're trying to find something. And then initial point is usually where you've been told something about the object, right? So what's a natural initial position for this object? Right at the top where it got dropped, right? So I always lay, like I draw a simple picture and then I label, right? Like this is the spot where I know something. They told me it was let go at 10 meters above the ground, right? So I know some things there. And then the final position is where I'm trying to find something. Since I want to know how fast it's going when it hits the ground or right before it hits the ground. I'll put my final point there. So initial point, final point, and then third, very important thing for your visualization, where is zero? Where is zero for gravitational potential energy? And so let me give you a rule of thumb, something that's kept me safe over the years, right, through college and into my career, so as I don't make as too many mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes, but you try to remove all the ones that are just a matter. 
I always pick zero to be the lowest point in the problem. That's not necessarily the final point. Often it is. But I always put zero at like the lowest measured point in the problem. So like if there's a roller coaster, right? And it starts up here and then it's going over a loop-de-loop -loop or a hill or something. I won't pick final where the loop-de-loop -loop is. I'll pick final at like the ground level, like the lowest point that the object makes. You'll see why this becomes helpful later. But the short version is it tends to avoid negative sign problems. Okay? And if we can avoid any kind of negative sign errors, we want to do that. So what's the lowest point in this problem? The floor, right? And so I'm going to put my zero for gravitational potential energy down there. Okay? So by the way, this isn't a zero, but that's the ball up at the top, right? So, and it just so happens in this problem that that coincides with my final position. They don't necessarily have to be the same. It's just that it's worked out this way. All right. With those, with that setup done, we can now pull off the strategy. And the strategy is always the same. You write out conservation of energy in all of its glory. And what do I mean by that? It's not just energy initially, but it's energy final. We have to include in here this work other term, this, this recycling bin of stuff that could be happening that we don't know how to deal with. Because this is free fall, we know that there is no air resistance, right? What's the definition of free fall? Only gravity, Only gravity right? However, with conservation of energy, we can actually start tackling air resistance. Where would we put air resistance in this statement? Into work other. We could just toss it in there, right? And, and start working out the problem. So we're starting with this. This is like a level up, right? Because if we did this with kinematics, <laughs> you'd have to go back and do what I showed you how to do, which is reinvent the toolbox using calculus because you'd have an acceleration that changes in time. It would start off at 9.8, but as it went faster and faster and faster, it got closer to its terminal velocity, the acceleration becomes smaller and smaller, eventually reach zero. So you'd have to reinvent the toolbox. It takes a long time. Here we can just do it in about four lines. I won't do, I won't do um, air resistance yet. We'll get there. Okay. So what is the strategy? Well, what you do and I'll only do this a few times, and after a while, I'm going to start taking shortcuts. But just here at the outset, since we're brand new, I'll show you everything that I'm going to be doing. Okay? So I'm going to leave the work other term in here for now. What kinds of energy can things have that we know about? Name a kind of energy. Potential energy, be very specific. Potential energy due to gravity. We learned about that one just now. What's the other kind of potential energy I've taught you about? Spring, potential energy. And then there's a third kind of energy, the energy of zoom zoom. Kinetic. Those are the only three kinds of energy that you're responsible for right now. Kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and spring potential energy. So what you want to do is realize that energy initial could be a combination of all three of those things. In other words, our energy initial could be our um, kinetic energy initial, our gravitational potential energy initial, and or our spring potential energy initial. That energy initial term right here okay, can encompass all three of those kinds of energies. And then we set that equal to the final energy. And how many different kinds of energy can be at the final position? Three. <laughs> it can have kinetic energy final potential energy from gravity final, and it can have potential energy from springs final. So that's, the, that's as bad as it can get, okay, where we have all three kinds going on here. 
But what you're going to want to do is go through and ask yourself, okay, are enter any of these energies zero? Like, is there a spring up there at the top where we've dropped the ball? No. So what's the initial spring potential energy in this problem? Zero. Zero. As a matter of fact, there's no springs mentioned anywhere. So what do we do with both of the spring potential energies? We can just say that they are zero. No springs. And sometimes I'll even write. No springs. Just to remind myself, right? Why did I cross that term out? Well, it's because there's no springs in the problem. Okay. What do we know about the initial kinetic energy of the object? It's zero. Why is it zero? Yeah. The initial speed is zero. So it can't have any kinetic energy. Which means the only thing that it does have is gravitational potential energy. Why does it have gravitational potential energy initially? Where is it not at? It's not at zero, right? Okay. The only place something can have no gravitational potential energy if it's at the place that we called zero. And it's not, so it must have something. Don't know what it is yet. We'll get there. I'm going through and I'm looking at each of these terms and I'm just asking myself the question, does this exist? Can I get rid of this, right? And if I can get rid of it, I'm happy. Don't get too uh, zero happy here. Oh, look, everything's zero. I can go home now. No, that's change your major to philosophy. Right? You gotta, you gotta be careful. You gotta have a justification for why you can call that thing zero. Okay, what about the final kinetic energy? of the object. Does it have kinetic energy right before it hits the ground? How do you answer that question? Is it moving? Is it moving right before it hits the ground? Yeah. So it's not going to be zero. So we've got to keep that. Okay. Uh, gravitational potential energy at the final position. What's that value going to be? Zero. Why is it going to be zero? Because that's where zero is. Right? We put zero at ground level and the final position is at ground level so I can go ahead and zero that one out okay all right so what I, what am I left with okay I'm left with a work other term a gravitational potential energy initial term and a final kinetic energy term those are the leftovers after going through the physics of my situation since there are no other forces in this problem Gravity and springs are handled by energy initial and energy final. Any other force we would have to include in work other, but the only force we have in this problem is gravity. What can we say work other is? Zero. We don't have any other forces. Normal tension, nothing else is going on in this problem, right? And so we can go ahead and say that there's no friction, right? It's only gravity, and gravity is already spoken for. Gravity and springs, those are handled by energy initial and energy final. Any other force would have to go and work under. Okay, so with all that mess done here, I'm left with potential energy gravity initial equals kinetic energy final. What is the mathematical format for gravitational potential energy. What does it look like? MGH. And what's the mathematical form for kinetic energy? Get you started. One half. M V squared, where that V would be the final V, right? And so now I solve for the final velocity. Can I get rid of the m's? I'm doing the do it step by now, by the way, right? I'm doing math. 2gh equals v squared. Swap that around, take a square root, and I get square root of 2gh. And lo and behold, what do you see here? Are those the same speed? Yeah, they are. So maybe you're sitting there going, well, Mr. Balo, 
I know how to do the stuff on the left. I've done this a lot. Why not just do it that way? Why go through all of this mental gymnastics and what's zero and how many does it do? And the answer is, well, for a case of free fall, yeah, kinematics is easier and faster. This is why we teach two first. Okay. But what happens if we do start adding air friction? Now the kinematics becomes super duper hard. But this will become this comes way easier. Again, we'll do that in here in a bit. But more importantly, Did you have to check the direction of anything over here on the right hand side? No. And what's just waiting to trip you up over here? Science, right? Conservation of energy doesn't care about science. There's going to be what is kind of, that's almost not true. There's one spot where you have to get the sign right, and that's in the word other. But we'll, we'll get there, okay? But for the rest of it, as long as you pick zero, in clever places, the signs are going to be automatical. They're just going to work out for you. That's because there's no vectors in conservation of energy, which is also a little bit of a lie because the work others going to have a little tiny dot product here. But yeah, okay. It really is, it's like the default go to in physics 4A. And I know we kind of waited until the middle of the semester to give it to you, right? But when you encounter a problem and you don't know if it's supposed to be kinematics or Newton's laws or energy, always try energy first. Always. It's the fastest, cleanest, most error-free method that you've come across so far. But here's a cheat sheet for how you know what to do when. If the problem is asking you about time, there's a 95% chance that has kinematics because that's where time lives, right? And all those kinematic equations got T in it, right? If the problem is asking you about a force, there's a 75% chance that's Newton's laws, particularly Newton's second law, okay? Force or acceleration, although acceleration it can be kinematics too, but it kind of depends. Like if they're giving you a bunch of forces, you have to find the acceleration, well, that, now you're stuck with Newton's laws, okay? If it doesn't ask about either of those things, or it doesn't care about acceleration and time, it's energy. Like if acceleration and time are not factors that you need to know, find, or care about, use conservation of energy. It's going to be faster. Conservation of energy really doesn't care what happens in between. All it cares about is beginning and end, and if there's any kind of work out there. All right, so let's, let's do some concrete examples here. We'll start this one, okay? And uh, we'll get going. Um, what I think I'd like you to do right now, okay, is turn to your neighbor and set this one up together. Like, like draw the picture together and talk about where you want to put initial and final and zero for this problem, okay? I'll give you like, I don't know, two or three minutes to do that. Go.
I wanted to make it very clear that this diver is not dead. <laughs> right? They are perfectly fine, okay? And no water was harmed in the creation of the diver. Where did you put zero? Where? Oh, oh, why? Did, oh, that's interesting. Why did you pick zero here? It's the lowest point in the problem. Oh, so you're going to trust me? Am I trustworthy that kind of that way? For now? Where did you kind of like want to put zero? Right at the water, right? Feels like kind of a natural place, right? And you wouldn't have gone wrong in doing that, but you would have had to have been very careful because the five meters would have become what? A negative five. And that's where that negative sign problem starts creeping in, which is why I like to put it at the lowest point in the problem. Okay. All right, so zeros down there. Where did you put your initial? Okay, where they jump off the... 10 meter platform. Anybody got off a 10 meter platform? No? Yeah? It, hitting the water feels like hitting a, a rock. <laughs> like it, it hurts <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. I was on the dive team and I still didn't know what I was doing and it hurt. Um, so that's because they had us doing three meter boards and then we went to a spot where, actually I think it was Clovis Wet. I grew up on the coast and we had a dive meet over here at Clovis and they had a 10 meter and they're like, yeah, you want to try it? I was like, sure. No training. Jumped off. That was not good. All right. I didn't belly flop, but I did have very red torso for a while. All right. Um, where did you put final? Where he stops? You don't want to put it at the water? No. Okay. Very good. I've either taught you well enough so that you trust me to pick these slots, or you don't really realize how this could all go wrong, okay? Or I, I miss teaching you something very critical. But no matter what it's one of those three cases is, it doesn't matter. You pick right, because there's a natural thing that newbies want to do in doing these kinds of problems, okay? And that's to break it up into too many parts. Sort of the, the new version of doing this would be to do the problem, like set the initial at the top and the final at the water. And then once you find out how fast they're going when they hit the water, do another problem where now the initials, the, the final that was is now the initial that is, is it right? And I, I, I can understand that this is kind of what we taught you to do with kinematics, right? If the acceleration changed, you had to, right, change and then do a new problem. But energy, energy doesn't care about that. Energy can deal with the changing acceleration because acceleration isn't anywhere in here. You can trust it. Just trust it. Mathematically, it's going to be a whole lot easier. Okay, so with those three things in place, what do we now write down? You don't even have to think about this one. It's automatic. What do you write? You just do the equation. Work other plus energy initial equals energy final. And um, what do you want to tackle first of those three things? Work other? Okay, let's just go straight for the hard part. Okay? Work other. Is there a force other than gravity and springs in this problem that's affecting the diver? Yes. What is it? It's the water, isn't it? So my work other term is going to become work done by the water. Notice, I'm not trying to like mathematically express what this is. I'm simply just indicating, yes, I have something going on here that's not gravity and springs. So I'm going to have to deal with it at some point, but conceptually, the water is doing some amount of work other on this diver. There's a force from the water. Is there a distance that the diver goes in the water? Yeah, so we, we can deal with that. Okay, now, what do we write down for energy initial? Potential 
Okay, so you probably want to try this a few times. You probably want to go through the whole motions of going, okay, I can have initial potential energy. I can have an initial kinetic energy, right? I can have final potential energy. I can have final kinetic energy. Like, like spell it out. Here, I haven't written down both types of potential energy because what's missing in this problem? Spring. There are no springs, right? So it's either going to be gravitational potential energy or that's it. There's <laughs> nothing else, right? So is there any potential energy initial? At the initial point, does, is, do I, am I at zero? <clears throat> no. Not at zero up there, right? So there is initial gravitational potential energy. Is there any initial kinetic energy? No, they step off the edge, right? They're not giving themselves any initial speed. So I can go here and say that one is zero because my initial speed is zero. All right, down at the final point, five meters below the surface of the water, what is the potential energy at that point? Why? Because that's where we put zero, right? So that zero. And what is the kinetic energy at the final point? What question are you asking yourself? You don't have to just mysteriously know about kinetic energy. What's the concrete question you can ask? Is, there is it moving? Is the diver moving five meters below the surface of the water? No, they came to a stop at that point. So what do we put down? Zero. I'm like, Mr. Mayhew, no, we crossed out too much. It can't possibly be this simple. All right, now for the really hard part. What is the work done by the water? It's FD cosine theta. It is a dot product, right? Okay. What direction was the diver going? Down. What direction was the force of the water on the diver? Up. What kind of work is this, positive or negative? Opposite directions of things, right? The force is up, diver's moving down. That's negative work. Whenever kinetic friction is involved, which is exactly what this is, it's negative work. So this is going to be negative. The force that the water exerts on the diver times the distance that the diver travels in the water. FD cosine theta if you want. I tend to drop the cosine theta and just think about it as a negative word, positive, unless there's an angle, in which case I do have to do the cosine theta. All right. What do I write down mathematically for the form of gravitational potential energy? MGH. And what do I write down for the mathematical form of zero? Zero. All right. What are we solving for? We're solving for the average resistance force given by the water. Well, that's FW, right? So FW times D is equal to MGH. If I move stuff around, right, either move the FD over one side becomes positive, whatever, right? This is what I get. I divide both sides by D, and I'm ready to go. It's a 70 kilogram diver. I'm on planet Earth. What total height does the diver fall through? Good, 15 meters. This is good. This is about the only place where you gotta be really careful, right? Is what do we mean by our heights and all that kind of stuff. And then what is D, the distance that the water acted on the diver? Five, right? So again, being careful with those distances as they're given in our problem gets us 2,060 Newtons or approximately 500 pounds of impact force. Okay. Now, it's 500 pounds spread out over five meters or roughly 15 feet of depth in the water. And as long as you land perpendicular to the surface with your hands braced, 
I've been told it's not an unpleasant experience. My personal experience tells me otherwise. But it still is amazing to see those divers who know what they're doing pull it off. All right. What horror would have awaited us if we didn't have conservation of energy? How would we have found that force if all we had was kinematics and Newton's laws? We would have had to do kinematics for the free fall, find out how fast it, and then some kinematics to find like an average acceleration in the water. And then with that acceleration, then do a Newton's second law problem with the free body diagram, including the force of the water resistance, gravity pulling down, and right? Not fun. And we did it in what? One, two, three, four, five lines? With conservation of energy? This is the power of conservation of energy. It just doesn't end run around all of these very complicated analysis, which are required sometimes. Because if we needed to know time or acceleration here, we'd be stuck. But since they didn't ask about any of that, we're actually free and in the clear. I want to do an example for you, uh, a conceptual example for you, okay? Um, here at the end, since I brought it. I need a volunteer. Somebody who believes in conservation of energy, who trusts it with every fiber of your being. Why are we pointing? Oh. Who would like to volunteer? David? Come on up, David. You raised your hand, I saw it. Unless somebody was making you and I didn't see that. Okay. Just against my will. Why don't you stand over there? Wow. Okay. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Never ask for volunteers before you show them the equipment. Would you hold that? Stand there and hold that. Um, you can hold it from the bottom. If it's not comfortable for you. Uh, is that heavy? Barely. Barely? Yeah, it's about a 10 pound ball at all. Okay. energy does it have? Trick question, but if we set this as the lowest point in the problem, how much does it have? Zero, Zero right? It's the lowest point in the problem. And if I bring it over here, I've now given it height, right? Mm -hmm. So it has gravitational potential energy, and if I let go, <laughs> then this gravitational potential energy is going to get converted into what? Kinetic energy, right? And so it's going to have the most kinetic energy you could ever have right here, because this is zero for potential energy, all that potential energy would get converted into kinetic energy, which would then eventually get converted into what? Potential energy again, right? So, if conservation of energy is true, and I take this bowling ball, and I hold it right in front of David's chin, and let go, what should happen? No! No! There are no deaths in physics. Call it insurance. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be a lawsuit. Step back. Okay, so like, who am I? Are you comfortably standing up straight? 
right? I'm gonna kind of hold this right next to his to his nose and chin and stuff like that, right? You got a good tail on that? Okay, right. And then I'm going to let go, right? Okay? And David doesn't have anything to worry about. Why does he not have anything to worry about? Because energy is conserved, right? This thing can never come back any higher than where it left. In fact, it'll be a little bit less because there uh, is friction here, right? Some work out that we're going to do. Here you go, right? You're going to flinch, flinch backwards. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Uh, don't lean forward. <laughs> you relax, right? Ready? Go. Oh, I was going to have to count. Oh, I'm going to have to place there, but what are you saying? Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Thank you, David. All right, my turn. I do have to test this every semester because you never know. <laughs> you, just, you, you never know. Physics changes all the time. And all. But, all right. So you see we found some more galaxies that are even older than the last ones we found and are not obeying any of the laws of physics that we have come up with. Okay, I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to close my eyes. Okay. Not because I'm scared, but because it adds extra thrill and danger. Why? I won't be able to see what's going on, but more importantly, your eyeballs is one of the primary ways that your head knows where it is in space. If you close your eyes, most of the information about where your head has moved in space gets lost. And you have a backup system inside of your ears. There's some ear canals in there that are filled with fluid that tell you kind of how the, the tilt of your head has changed in three-dimensional space, but it's not very accurate. And it certainly isn't accurate to the one centimeter resolution I really need to know if I've moved my head too far one way or the other. And not only that, I'm going to squish the ball directly into my nose. Like I'm going to compress it, OK? As far as I didn't want to do that with David because you know physics terms. So. so here we go. Okay. So I've got to, I've got to push it in. Hey, I've got to close my eyes. No pushing. <laughs> We're good, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, James. Oh. <laughs> it never comes back. It's high, right, right? Okay, so even though I push it into my face, it never comes back. Right? The, oh, yeah, if we went and pushed it, I saw some of you out there rooting for the ball to come back with more energy. You're like, this time, please, universe, just let it not be. Right? Because students always want to see their physics teachers harmed in some way. If somebody came along and pushed it from the other side, that would be work other, right? That would be energy that gets added. It would be positive work because we're adding energy to the system. But if somebody came in and blocked the ball with their body to save me, that would be negative work other because they're taking energy out of us. All right, on Wednesday, we're just going to do more examples, right? Tons more examples of applying uh, conservation of energy. And then hopefully, hopefully we'll do a, do a um, field trip, weather permitting.